Well, it's a real pleasure to be here and to celebrate Alex's uh, 80th birthday when see so many uh, friends and, and colleagues here. Um, I guess I'm the only director or former director uh, who's free to speak, and Alex doesn't have a slot, and uh, the other two here are in the saddle still, so I can make somewhat more uh, open remarks, perhaps. Um, first of all, I want to make a personal comment about Alex. I mean, there's so many wonderful things to say. I'm not sure he remembers this, though, but I was a bit awed by Alex when I came here as a graduate student in the late 60s, early 70s, and so I didn't choose him as a advisor. Instead, I chose someone I thought I could impress uh, a little more, Bill Reinhardt, who turned out to be a wonderful advisor. But Alex, do you remember that that basically the entire Reinhardt group showed up at the CFA and stayed there and used all your computer time and, and your offices. I mean, this was going on for years. And I found it an incredibly warm and uh, supportive environment. I loved working in the library, going up and running the cards through the 6600, I think it was. That was as opposed to using the uh, horrible computer center uh, on Oxford Street in which you would give your cards to some surly operator and then maybe if they were in the mood, they'd hand your output back about five hours later, four hours after it actually had been printed out. So uh, that, that was just a wonderful thing, and, and I, I really felt the, uh, the, the first effects of Alex uh, uh, back then. Thanks, Alex, uh, all these years later for your generosity. Um, it's already been stipulated that ITAMP would never have existed without Alex, but I want to stipulate that actually Alex is the property of the whole AMO community and the world. And that was really the reason how, uh, I mean, one way to look at the formation of ITAMP. I mean, how do you leverage this uh, tremendous talent, warm personality, and mentorship uh, for the benefit of AMO? So I know it's not the reasons given, and, and, and maybe it wasn't even on some people's minds, but I think what happened was a Max Planck type institute got built around Alex. That was the boundary conditions. That's what happened here in the early days. And, and, and it was a great idea, and it worked absolutely uh, uh, beautifully. Um, I think I won't, I, I want to cut this short because we're running late, but I, I think some of the Max Planck ideas uh, could still be applied to this institute for the future, but I, I won't get into that today. One of the things that just barely, barely been mentioned uh, is the Center for Ultra Cold Atoms. Uh, actually, the Center for Ultra Cold Atoms would not exist without ITAM and would not exist without Barry Schneider. Uh, Barry planted a bug in my ear. I spoke to Dan Kleppner. I think Dan would verify this. Is Dan here? And uh, that's how it got started. So um, uh, the Center for Ultra Cold Atoms is certainly uh, another bright star in Cambridge and in AMO, uh, which we can attribute ultimately to Alex because uh, as we know, ITAMP wouldn't have happened without him. I'd like to mention a couple of things that Barry said uh, about this 20% number. It's a very serious number. 20% uh, of the AMO budget. You know, how could you keep putting up with this year after year? And my comment about that is it's worth it even if it stays 20%. But the reason it's, that's such a shocking number is that the AMO budget for theory is too low. I mean, that's, uh, you know, keep, keep the uh, budget the same and then that 20% will drop to 10% when you double the AMO theory budget. Um, so another thing I'd like to mention in response to Barry, since he brought it up, um, the, the, the artwork. This is just sort of for fun and because, you know, outreach is a big deal at NSF. I think we all know that. I just want to mention the dangers of doing too much outreach. As Barry mentioned, my artwork is is all over the halls of NSF. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, one of my pieces formed the cover, the whole cover of the NSF budget request to Congress. And that was the year for the first time my NSF individual grant request was turned down. With a comment from, a, from two referees, negative comments about my artwork. One said it wasn't art, and the other one said it wasn't actually teaching anybody anything, as if I was supposed to teach quantum mechanics successfully to the public. But anyway, um, I think that um, this, this is just a personal story, but our, our outreach can have its 
can have its dangers. Uh, after five years, uh, I stepped down from the directorship, not because I was in any way unhappy and I hope they weren't unhappy with me, but there was a bit of instability built into the original boundary conditions, which Misha has now satisfied by default, and that is when you have a half-time tenured but half-time appointment at Harvard and you're teaching full-time but your government, your, your salary is pegged to the government salary, that is an unstable situation. And so that's really what happened and I felt that five years was, was a sufficient block of time to at least be, to be credible. Um, so I wanted to, all these years later, set that, set that straight. Um, I'll just finish by saying uh, not only did I get a lot of students when I first came, but Misha has attracted an even bigger following. Misha was an amazing coup for us. It was not easy, as Kate remembers, to get physics interested in Misha. We don't have postdocs give talks. That was the first response I got. Um, and then after much preparation, Misha gave one of the best talks they ever heard, and my job after that was, was easy. And now it seems that half the retention battles we fight in the physics department are trying to keep Misha. Now, isn't that a success story, I think, for ITAMP and for AMO physics? Uh, we're really proud of him. Uh, so I'll just finish by saying um, that I think we have largely, as Kate outlined just now, succeeded in spreading AMO theory to more physics departments. And we have to remember it's also by broadening what is meant by AMO. I mean, I, I think, for example, broadening AMO to include the AMO mindset coming into fields like condensed matter theory, where you use scattering theory rather than many body theory. Uh, that counts, you know, quantum dots, scattering tunneling microscopy. And we shouldn't uh, forget that quantum information and, and quantum computing are even bigger, of course, in really our AMO theory, to a large part of the AMO theory. So uh, I'll finish there and uh, thank Alex again for starting it all.